All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Conscious Corner, a program dedicated to Black truth, one that draws from the history and con uh, contemporary issues that Black people face. This is our first podcast. And it's hosted by myself, Amin Ra, and brother, professor, uh, historian Joe Hembrick, as well as we are a uh, product of the Community Education Network. And we, we, are, we are outgrowth of that. Uh, this, as I said, this is our first uh, uh, podcast, and we got an outstanding guest tonight. And we want you to know that he will be hopefully a reoccurring um, guest to share his wealth of knowledge and experience in the, in, as, as an author, as a person with a deep thought and deep understanding of the issues that we face. And he captures them in his book, former professional baseball player and a product of the city of Compton. And uh, we are just happy to have him on. And we're going to let him get started by telling us a little bit about himself and a little bit about his book. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, any other issues that he'd like to bring up. So go ahead. Right. Thank you, Amon Ra. And uh, Joe Hember, I'd like to thank you. And also Rigo. Before I get started, I want to thank the high powers for allowing us to be together today. My name is Calvin Moore. I was born in Los Angeles at White Memorial Hospital. My parents moved to Compton in 56 when I was three years old. And I was educated in Compton schools for those Comptonites who are familiar with that. I went to Caldwell Street School. I went to Enterprise Junior High School and I graduated from Compton High School. And from then on, I went to college. Now, a little bit about my book is about a good gangster named Chris Bell, who reformed the west side of Chicago. He turned it into a black Wall Street. And for those of you don't of you who don't know what a black Wall Street is, uh, Black Wall Street in Oklahoma, it was on the streets of Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. And as for an acronym, that spells GAP, right? Greenwood, Archer, Pine. Well, you know who came from there? The GAP Band, which is one of the hottest bands in, in the country at one time. Now, Black Wall Street was demolished burned down in 1921 by a group of people that weren't very nice to them. Well, you could say they were Caucasians, burned it down to the ground. And uh, it has never been the same. They tried to make it uh, the same again, but they couldn't reach it because all a lot of people were killed there. And a lot of the uh, people that uh, put it together, who organized it and kept it going were killed. So they didn't have the manpower to do so. Natural Born Gangster, uh, The Legend of Chris Bell. I would like everybody to know about it, especially in the black community because uh, I think they should be conscious of who they are and what they need to do in order to in order to improve. Is there anything else? Oh no, uh, no. I just want would like for you to just you know uh, give a little bit more in depth about the relevancy of the book, why you wrote it, why. Okay. You felt that this story was uh, a message? Well, what message you want people to get out the book? Okay, now, really, what motivated me to write the book 
in the 80s, we had a crack cocaine epidemic that really changed the lives of a lot of people. My best friend, and I'll mention his name right now, Doug Foster, he lived across the street from me. And we uh, used to uh, play baseball together. He was drafted by the Dodgers as well, as Kenny Lander was. But he got caught up in the uh, cocaine scare. My brother, who I love very much, got caught up in that scare too. And I saw how the cocaine really rearranged and changed a whole lot, especially the landscape and the demographics in uh, Compton. That's what motivated me to write the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like for us to be more conscious of drugs and alcohol in the black community, mm -hmm. because I believe that that really hurt us as a people. Mm -hmm. now, now you were saying that Chris, Chris uh, uh, Bell was, uh, uh, is, is he a fictitious character or he? Uh, yes, he is. He is a fictitious character. But now but he, the, he the represented other people that have gotten messed up with drugs or he turned it into a profitable business. Well, the book is really a very similar to, and that means it's fiction and nonfiction mixed. It has the appearance of being real. Uh, the book should motivate, and I would like it to, to motivate a lot of uh, gang youth, what we know as gang bangers, mm -hmm. to change their ways instead of hurting the community help the community because chris bell that's exactly what he did he went through the west side of chicago the ghetto ridden chicago west side and he cleaned it up his gang of 216 members cleaned it up they painted the buildings they got rid of all the glass and everything that was around in the streets the weeds and, and all that. He even educated them. Uh, that education was mandatory. So they went to the uh, Muslim mosque to get educated. The Muslims worked with and collaborated with the gang members. But Chris Bell was a different type of gangster. He didn't want to destroy. He didn't want to fight for unowned property. He wanted to build and start businesses and even a bank on the West side, which he accomplished. So, so you really want this, this book should be sort of like uh, in an English class in high school, a required class or whatever that students should be reading this book. Well, I would like for it to be, yes, because I, I believe that it would get into the psyche of the youth and there would be change from that way. And, and I know that unity is very important. See, but we got a unified spirit. Mm -hmm. I believe that the unity of spirit is very powerful. At the uh, physical unity is powerful too. A medium man march can change things. A riot can change things. But spiritually, if, if they got together, they could really do some, some good works. So how does, do you think, uh, not, not to get away from the book, but because I think that's very interesting. What about with regards to the utilization of sports? Uh, I know that sports helped you. Do you think sports uh, could help you, youth also? Well, yes, of course. Uh, sports really uh, taught me a lot when I was young. In other words, if I'm pitching and somebody hits a ball to center field, I can make that play in center field. I have to depend on my center fielder to make that play. 
Mm. So it's camaraderie and team sports. Mm. Uh, and the uh, silent of nights, or I should say the shadow of nights, I'm sorry. Mm. The shadow of nights, the gang that Chris Bell made, developed, they were a team. Mm. It was a team, they treated it like a team sport. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe, you you got any questions, Joe? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Joe. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I read the book in its entirety months ago. Uh, and matter of fact, as I mentioned, me and Calvin came up playing little league baseball together. I think he was telling you about that team before the show started. And I think Kenny was drafted by the Angels, not the Dodgers, Calvin, but that's neither here nor there. Oh, but, okay. Uh, Very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was, but he, he didn't play for the Dodgers. You're right. Right, right. right. But uh, uh, the book was fascinating to me how, you know, the Afrocentric stuff was interjected throughout the book. Uh, I, know, I know one aspect that's going to be controversial tonight is the fact that Chris Bell had his uh, men read the read the Willie Lynch letter, a uh, alleged letter to you know, so he can show his people, you know, like what happened to them and why we kind of you know act and conduct ourselves like we do. I thought that was pretty instrumental because whenever you can unite against a common enemy, you can kind of bring folks together uh, quicker, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, the book well, it took a long time to get through it, uh, but I was diligent and did it. Um, but the Afrocentric inputs throughout the book is what kept me interested in what I was reading. Um, interesting how he was schooled by the, what was the brother's name, the Maji Calvin? Uh, uh, the the brother brother's that was name was Madi. M-A-D-I. Madi that was schooled. Yeah that was schooling Chris Bell along the way. I thought all that was, was powerful. So, uh, yeah, me, me and Calvin have talked about the book a lot. Um, and uh, I love the fact that they got away from killing and resorted to the march of the art. Be right back, go ahead, Joe. I'll be right back. Injured person instead of bringing death to him, which I think mm -hmm. that was which I thought that was good also. Uh, took took about three months to get through the book. It's like 600 some pages. Uh, so uh, uh, I love the way that they got off the normal gang thing and resorted to other aspects. Uh, like he was, he, he was talking about the green, uh, uh, the, uh, the black, uh, you know they 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 you know they renovated these old buildings to help get the homeless off the street, and uh, they they stop they stop selling dope, yeah, and yeah. they started uh, uh, you froze again. Joe froze. Yeah. Uh, hiring themselves out like security, like the nation does at the time. But it was like it was like a high dollar, you know, security. And they would take that money into Am I breaking up? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh uh, uh Carl can, can can tell you about that part. How they raise money and uh, help the, the turn convert oh. those apartments into uh, uh, places for the homeless and how they raised money to do uh, they became security and things that's uh, that part of the book Calvin okay that part of the book Chris Bell one day he scoured the west side he picked up everybody that was aimless and looked homeless and was sleeping on park benches and he fed them. He also uh, got together with his people, which was Derek Jenkins and Tracy, 
in the book, fictional characters. And he paid them to get off drugs. And he also gave them a job. And their job was to be spies for the nation of the SOKs, the SOK nation. He actually paid them. And later on in the book, it, it helped them because when they started uh, dropping drugs on the uh, on the west side, they told them who it was. They told them all the strangers that came in town. They were spies. They knew their own neighborhood, and he uh, told his his uh, troops to really understand and learn every whorehouse, every liquor store, every uh, drug spot, every inch of their own neighborhood so they would know it. And uh, that information became very profitable when the, uh, when the powers at B came in and tried to find them because what they did ultimately was drop 60 tons of drugs on the FBI's doorstep because they found out who it was that was uh, dropping drugs in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So how did they do that? Well, the okay, they were ninjas. They were trained ninjas. Uh, Chris Bell, he was being harassed by an older guy. He was actually scared of him. So the guys in the neighborhood, my D, really, and you'll find out in the book that he started a group called GGWB. And that's an acronym for good guys wear black. And he studied martial arts and he became a ninja. But Chris Bell was a star child. He was a star child and he cared for everybody. And the reason why he did this, what his real motivation was his mother and sister. He didn't want them to get crushed or killed by, by the black disciples or the disciples. See, they were a rival gang. And through the book, the black disciples were trying to destroy the vice lords. Chris Bell was a part of the vice lords, but he started his own part of the vice lords uh, by naming them SOKs, the silent, the shadow of nights, the shadow of nights. And that was something that I had to change. And it was kind of like, uh, in my muscle memory, but it's the shadow of night. And he trained uh, 216 people, uh, uh, his troop, to be ninjas. But they had 10 elite ones that were very good. And that's how he was able to change things. They had a war in the book with the disciples, and they didn't kill one of them but the disciples were not trained. So what they did was they killed 500 of them with friendly fire because they were, they didn't know what was happening. And these guys were ninjas. They were trained at the time and uh, they couldn't see anything. So they just started shooting at anything they thought they saw and they were killing each other. Mm -hmm. You ever hear the uh, the movie The Education of Sonny Carson? No, no, have Because that's a that's a movie that sounded like he didn't do what Chris did as far as that, but uh, it was it's just an interesting movie about a young man growing up and uh, uh, you know the gang uh, situation. I just thought because it, it has a certain amount of parallel with what you're talking about, on of not that he. You know, he went to prison and then he, you know, came back and everybody was in trouble. Everybody was, 
either dead or in jail. And, 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 and his woman had turned to heroin. She became a heroin addict. And yeah, see. All of those stuff. But uh, it's interesting because, I, I you know, I, I used to know about the Blackstone Range. Chris Bell was dead set against drugs. Oh, he didn't like them. Of, yeah. Huh? He didn't like drugs at oh, all. Okay. And in fact, he trained his troops uh, to not do drugs and okay. even wear a condom when they were having sex. <laughs> wow. He uh, was a very astute young man. He was only 13 years old when he uh, took over the West Side, Lord mm -hmm. Eyes. That's I apostrophe S, a fictional character in the book. When he took over, Lord Eyes gave him because he was over, he was the prince of, of the vice lords. When he took over, he gave Chris Bell control of the West Side. So Chris Bell, he, uh, did what he thought he needed to do in order to protect his mother and sister and all his friends and to change the West Side to a Black Wall Street. Mm. Mm. And when you say Black Wall Street, they opened up businesses and... Yes, they did. Mm. They opened up businesses and they had banks. He opened up mm. a bank. Mm. See, but he had friends. He had wealthy friends uh, that were Jewish because his mother was a cosmetologist. She fixed hair and she fixed their hair and they liked Chris Bell since he was born. So they did everything they could to help him to do what he did. And, and they loaned him money, mm. big money mm. to accomplish his dreams. Mm. All right. Brotherhood, are you there? In China? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. You, you, have you been listening to the discussion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been listening, man. Uh, you have I just any... had a couple of. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was wondering um, what you said. Is this? Are you talking about the uh, the peace stones? Well, what no. era was this? No, I'm, I'm talking about the vice lords of Chicago and the disciples okay. of Chicago. Okay. All right. And um, what, what era would you say? I, I got to get the book. I haven't read it, but what era would you say uh, this era? guy lived? Chris Bell. Chris Bell was born yeah. January 1st, 1969. He did all this before he was 17. Okay, so yeah, during the 80s. During that's, the 80s, okay. Yeah, that's yeah, it's funny, funny you mentioned um okay. During the 80s. Okay, yeah, okay. I was trying to get a frame of reference from it, man, because uh you know, um I've done a little research, Cal State Fullerton, man, and I took a class with Dr. Gathiga. I don't know if you know him, Mr. Uh, Amon Ra. He started the program over at Long Beach, I mean, uh, at Fullerton. And uh, there was some stuff I read about, you know, us, you know, us doing those kinds of things and, you know, trying to, trying to build, you know? And then with Wall Street, like Wall Street, you know, I was born there, you know? So I, I definitely, had a different take, man, because actually, you know, going over and then realized I went, I went to a middle school. You breaking up? Was, you know, these people I died at, and I, and I didn't even know any of it. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is that a little better? Yeah. A lot better. Okay. Yeah. And I was saying that, um, the history, man. Okay. Yeah. The history is, is definitely to be told, man. And, uh, I was just trying to get the error on it. Um, but what is uh like with with Chicago, um, you know the Wall Street. I know in, in Oklahoma and Tulsa, man. But from what I had researched and heard, was like 
when people tried to rebuild, rebuild that situation, it was like the Urban League basically came in and, and basically dismantled, started dismantling everything. You know, and uh, is that similar to what you think happened? I know you said a lot of people died that started it, but there were there were a lot of you know city city ordinances and things that came into place that even prevented it. Like you know, even if you had the knowledge to build, it was like they was putting all these these roadblocks in place. Well, what they you know, did, and then they basically those highways through it, right? And, and a baseball domain. field. Yeah, yeah. I'm in the domain. That's what it was. Yeah, they built high, high under the guise of the Urban League. Is... Roy, you can respond, uh, Carl. Yeah, man, uh, Charlie, man, I, my dad actually went to middle school with him over at Carver, played with him. Mm, okay. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Can you can you repeat that, Brother Hood? We didn't we didn't hear it clearly. Oh yeah, I was saying that uh I remember I recall you mentioned the guy band, you know, my dad went to school with those brothers, man. And and I remember, you know, hearing those stories about about, about that, you know, but it's crazy how in school, you know, they don't they don't teach that. And then actually realizing that I think what was a was a big part of the success. Can you hear me now? A big part of success was we had, you know, not only just businesses, we had our own hospitals and schools from from kindergarten all the way up to high school. You know, the educational system, the bus system, transportation system, every system was already in place, you know. And so, you know, that, that's kind of what when it came in, that the ordinances just kind of dismantled all of that. That's, that's kind of it's like a recipe for disaster with that. So it just needs to get out, man, because people don't really know, man. And the thing is, is that the two newspapers in, the, in Tulsa that has a lot of that history, you know, it's just buried. You know, you got to get, you got to really do your research to pull it out. You know, some of it's on the internet, but a lot of it is not. But anyway, I'm just, I'm just sharing, man. Well, well you know, LeBron James, LeBron James and somebody named Maver Mavericks or something, they're doing a production called Dream Something all about um, uh, the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre and, uh, uh, you know, the destruction of the property and the, and the struggle. It's supposed to be a very interesting documentary on CNN. So, uh, and I, I taught it a lot at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, they, they've had a number of films about it uh, with regards to uh, Tulsa. And the Gap Band, I remember Lonnie, who used to run the Total Experience, was their manager. And he, they used to record at Lonnie's studio. And then, uh, oh, okay. then, then uh, Charlie Wilson, and I forget the other brother's name, but uh, they were hot, brother. They had some good, 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 good music. Yeah. But uh, Calvin. Yes. Now, with regards to the, um, um, the moral of the story of the book. What, what did you? What were some of the morals of the story? Well, I believe that I was getting at uh, how the blueprint on how to improve gang relations and eliminate gang warfare, because ultimately, what the gangs are doing is fighting over unowned turf. They don't own anything. So stop fighting, get together, put your money together to own something. Because it's a lot of money floating through uh, the gangs and with drugs. We see it every day on TV. Wasn't that somewhat the brother that was over there off of uh, Crenshaw and Slauson was doing? Uh, what's his name that got shot and killed? Oh, right Nipsey there. Hustle? Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, I mean, he, he turned the music, of course, but he was, you know, he came out the gang element. And he tried to convert people, hire people, and get them to think like that. Yes, he was doing it, and he did it himself. Mm. See, but when you have uh, numbers, you have power, and also you have good fighters. 
like it was in the shadow of nights, you can change a lot of things. And I'd like to mention that uh, Black Wall Street was built on 40 acres of land. And we have heard the old saying, 40 acres in the mule. Mm -hmm. So they did get their 40 acres in the mule on Black Wall Street. They developed it though. Yes, they developed it. They, they got their 40 acres in the mule because uh, per capita, at one point in time, Black Wall Street was the richest community on the face of the planet. And that's what we need to understand. Per capita, that means each person in Black Wall Street was worth more than any other person in the world. And we know what happened to, to White Wall Street in 1929. I believe if White Wall Street would have collaborated with Black Wall Street, we would have had no depression or a less severe depression. That's a good idea. Okay, Mshinga, you have any comments? Mshinga? Oh, she's there. Mm. What Brother, about you, Rigo? Brother Mashinda. Mashinda. Yeah. Mashinda. Well, what about you, uh, Raskani? Rashikani? Well, I'm in the Rashikani. process. Rashikani. Yeah. Yes, I'm in the process of reading the book right now. And uh, it's been, so far, it's been very interesting. And uh, I have some particular uh, notes that I will be asking when, when uh, Brother Calvin come to the CEN show. See, I'm, right I'm, now, I'm, I'm just I'm, taking a dip in the pool. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting some, some information that I want to talk about because he, he made some interesting, uh, you know, quotes and it's, it's just a, some real good information in there. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good book. I recommend anybody that, especially people that, that grew up in inner cities, it's a, it's a high recommendation for them to, to uh, get some information. It's, it's, so far, it's been real great. So I, I have a long way to go to finish it, but it's, it's, uh, it's full of good information. Okay. You know, okay. I, I, I'm going to intervene right there. A lot of people uh, of my own friends, my own little circle, they say, Calvin, why is the book so long? See, because your average novel is 300 pages. That's twice as long as your average novel. When I started writing that, I just started writing. The same thing I did when I was a kid. I just started writing. And then I put it together. I didn't want to eradicate anything that I had written. So I put it all together. And at the end of the day, it was 640 pages, a thick book. Some of my friends call it a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that, Joe? Yes. I can't see you, but I heard you laugh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know what's happening with my communication this evening, but uh, I think if the Bible may be dope. I think the Bible might be 1,100 pages, maybe. The, well, with the whole new. But we, we, we ain't going to go there tonight, I don't think, but we might. <laughs> we don't <laughs> uh, have brother, to. Bro, bro, brother Cal. Yes. Uh, uh, I also noticed that you had some of the metaphysical uh uh, a spirituality in the book. Do you care to elaborate on that? Yes. Metaphysics is spirituality. See, in other words, Wasset University, I heard your first talk, Joe, and it's the oldest and the first university on the face of the planet. And over the door, it had know thyself. Okay? Now, 
we must know ourselves. Right? And by knowing ourselves, I think that there's two things you have to know, two categories, your chakras and that you're a melanated body. Now, we have 12 basic chakras, five outer body chakras and seven body chakras. I would love to go over those yeah, so we could know what they are because that's how you filter the power from the cosmos, the universal cosmos. You filter it through your chakras and then you ignite or awaken that kundalini energy and it rises up your spine and it opens your third eye pineal gland, which is dark blue. That's how you communicate. Well, you might, brother, you might want to explain to the audience what chakras are. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. I will. <laughs> chakras are energy centers. They output and input information. So we receive information all the time. We get most of our information, or a lot of it, from the UV rays from the sun. And it's all around us, the information. But we can't process it because we don't know how. But your 12th chakra, which is your aura chakra, is black. You got to know the colors, too. And your 11th chakra, which is your hand chakra, pink. You get energy from your hands. See, this is the Nessie Amsu position. Our ancestors used to do this. Why did they used to do it? because they know their hands were chakras and they were receiving energy through, through their hands. And that color of that is pink. And then you have the 10th uh, chakra, which is your feet chakra, which is brown. One time I was demonstrating to a friend of mine how you get energy from the sun. And I was laying down uh, with my feet in there and my hands up. And you know, my friend said, you look like a dead bug. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny to me. Now, your ninth chakra is your silver chakra, soul chakra, your silver soul chakra, your eighth chakra, eighth chakra, uh, chakra, which is the last of the outer body chakras, is the uh, gold chakra. Uh, Akashic record. Now you've seen pictures of a Jesus Christ or, or anybody else with a halo, a gold halo around, right? That's the Akashic record chakra. Okay. Now the Akashic record chakra, it can do lots of things: your past lives, present lives, and your future lives. That's metaphysical. A lot of people don't even believe in reincarnation. A lot of people do. But that's what your Akashic record is. Now, your body chakras. The crown chakras is, is purple. Purple. It opens up everything to you. That's in the cosmos. Because we are sun people. We are cosmic people. We just need to realize that. And we have all the cosmic tools in our body to reach anywhere we want to go. Now, there's a such thing as astral journeys, where, where your uh, astral body separates from your physical body and you just fly around like Superman, okay? A lot of us don't believe that, but we have that power. Now, uh, your seventh chakra, is your third eye, pineal gland chakra. Third eye, see, I believe the third eye, and this is my opinion. Yeah, you know, other people can have their opinion too, but it can see in the nucleus of an atom. It can see everything. If you know what it can do, and then you can accept the information that it's giving to you. Uh, and that's also, the pineal gland. You can consider the pineal gland and the third eye combined. 
they're one. Now, in a lot of books that you read, they say that the pineal gland does not produce melanin. Melanin is produced in the melanocytes in your skin and, and in your intestines, okay? But I believe that the uh, pineal gland secretes the pigment melanin. It also secretes a hormone, melatonin and serotonin. Now, I believe that melanin is the most powerful medicine in the universe. That's metaphysical. I believe that. See, you know how much, uh, look, you can take a square centimeter of power from the universe and boil out all the oceans of the earth. That's how much power is out there. But we, we don't know that and we're not taught that. You said in your first uh, talk that it took 40 years to graduate from Wasset University. You're right. It took that long. Today, you can get a PhD in eight years. But our ancestors went to school for 40 years to become pharaohs or emoteps or grandmasters. A lot of people don't know what emoteps are. An emotep is a, everything rolled into one. He's a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief. Uh, anything you want him to be. That's Imhotep. Now, Grand Master is not a chess player who can play chess very well. Now, wait a minute. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Uh, can you hear me, Brother Ra? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that, that metaphysical uh, world is uh, something I'm tipping my toes in. Uh, but I do know the sun is, 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 is the key. That's yeah. why, you, that's why mm -hmm. when you call a lot of times. I'm in the backyard, so, you know, sucking it up, letting it build me up and whatnot. Uh, but you, you got to remember, uh, brother, Dr. Richard King, he went to Markham too. He, he, he wrote the book on melanin uh, and the pineal gland. And uh, Dr. Lagan and his wife on San Barbara had a bookstore called The Erases. And they put out writings on a magazine called Erases. And they had a lot of the metaphysics uh, a part of that levitations uh, with regards to how they built the pyramids and M Hotel was considered the world's first multi-genius as right. a matter of fact, there's a black doctor's organization called in, in Hotel, in the Hotel and they meet annually uh, that, that the M, M Hotel pre pre preceded the, uh, uh, the Hippocrates. So, and some people say it more hypocritical. Right. But the point right. is, is that uh, the, there's a lot of people that deal with the pineal gland and uh, as Calvin was saying, the third eye. And that's what makes you whole, your consciousness, your spirituality in connection with your, uh, em empowers your physical uh, aspects uh, and, and deepness. And that's where your pigmentation comes from. And that's why, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that aspect. That's why they say babies come out light until they hit that sun and then all of a sudden they get some, some color. But go ahead, Calvin, you ended up. Okay, I'm sorry for the interruption. Okay, I, I was on the, uh, the third eye pineal gland and melanin, I believe is the best medicine in the universe. And we secrete it naturally. And of course, like you were saying, Amon Ra, uh, it uh, depicts the color of our skin. We remember our ancestors saying, the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. Okay, well, a more melanated person is a darker person. 
Now, everybody has melanin. Uh, there's neuromelanin, which the Africans naturally secrete. And there's pheomelanin. We need melanin in order to survive. Now, this is something else I believe in metaphysics, that melanin keeps the sun from bumping into the moon. That's how powerful it is. Now, we need to concentrate on melanin. Okay, now, I'm moving right along. <laughs> to borrow my quota. Huh? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> and now, uh, the uh, sixth chakra, of course, is a, now the, the dark blue is, is the color for the uh, uh, pineal gland uh, and the uh, and the third eye. Now, I, I tried to elaborate on the third eye for you because the third eye is so important. You can see so much that others can't see. They said that Superman had x-ray vision. You know what kind of vision you'll have in the third eye? If you just believed in it, you could see into the nucleus of an atom. Okay, now, I don't want to get into atom because it take too much time now. But uh, let's talk about uh, the chakra just below that, and it, it's very important. The throat chakra is light blue in color, and of course it does what. Uh, what it, what it says uh, is self-explanatory. The throat chakra means that you can communicate well. Okay, and we have to communicate. You heard the old saying, the closed mouth don't get fed. Yeah. But you have to be quiet at times and, be, and, and talk when you're supposed to talk. Okay, and you have to open your mouth to eat, of course. Now, I'm you back. I'm on the Zoom. Go on. I'm I'm going on to uh I'll call you back. the heart chakra, which is green. Now I've I've got to uh, say this. We have five brains, not just one brain. And the heart chakra is one of them. The heart is one of them. We have a lot of brain cells in our heart. And that's why they say, follow your heart or think with your heart or whatever the sayings are. Now, uh, the five brains are the brain brain, which is your main brain, the subconscious mind. The heart brain, the stomach brain, that's four. And also the skin brain. Our skin has, it thinks. And it breathes. It thinks. Our skin thinks. Now, we may not know that it thinks, but uh, you can feel certain things that happen. You don't have to see it. You can feel it. Now, uh, moving right along. <laughs> yeah, we do have the chakra that's just below that. And it's the, uh, the solar plexus chakra, which is yellow. You know, uh, uh, Iron Man, right? Iron Man has all that power coming from right here. If you, and it's just a fictitious character, a cartoon character. But that power comes from right there, the solar plexus. We have the same, we can do the same thing. We have that power too. So just think of it as Iron Man. Everybody's seen that. And below that is orange, is orange. The stomach chakra. And the stomach is one of our five brains. That's how powerful it is. And our last chakra is a red root chakra. And it is located uh, on the spine, at the base of the spine. Now, all these chakras are located on the spine. So if you have a back problem, that kundalini energy that awakens in the gooch area may not reach all the way to the uh, pineal gland to release 
the magical properties there. If you know that it's happening in your body. That's heavy. Uh, also, I'd like to mention in the book, when you talk about the, when you write about the, make reference to the chakras and when the brothers on the boat fishing, catching certain fish, I recall you using those colors, uh, you know, the, you know, the, uh, that represents certain chakra in the book while I was reading it. Very good point, Joe. Uh, yes, those colors are represented. See, when they caught the fish they caught, in order to know the person who caught the fish, they were given a color, uh, a little uh, ribbon, and they pinned it on them. And they knew they caught that particular fish because that day when they were fishing, it was a whole lot of fish being caught. I'm talking about some expensive fish. The last time I checked, a blue marlin would sell for $3.1 million. And then my uh, character, uh, Marco, the uh, guy who was in charge of the ship that they were on, and the ship was owned by the vigilantes. Now, that guy was a gangster. But he was uh, a protected gangster. He had he had a uh, immunity all over Europe. He was based in Sicily, in Syracuse, uh, Italy. I'm sorry, in Syracuse, Italy. He was based there, and Chris. He did what he did with the Mexicans and he saved their lives. And the Mexicans told uh, the uh, stepfather, which is a character in my book, about Chris's gang. And that's how he got the invitation to go meet him. Did I answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Well, 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 to clear up some, uh, you know, for the listening audience. You know, when Chris Bell and them stopped selling drugs and all of that, they resorted to, you know, working as security, like I mentioned earlier. And they were hired out around the world, basically to work for a lot of cartels and whatnot. So that's what he's speaking about when he was on the boat. They were going over to meet with someone of that caliber in society. So just wanted to clear that up for the listening audience, Calvin, that didn't know. I, I think I'm still the only one that has read the book in its entirety. I, I, yeah, J Joe, everybody's saying, Calvin, it's the Bible, it's too long. But if you read it step by step, day by day, and uh, I tried to put short chapters in it so you can read a chapter at a sitting, uh, and then you'll be fine. Uh, I, I had the book uh, reviewed online book review and it's on the internet you can read what the reviewer said about it he actually said that in the beginning that it was kind of boring now he said that i believe because he didn't understand what the author was doing or the art in the book the artistry in the book now i don't think it's a boring page in it of course i'm going to say that because i wrote it and his information in there, every page, I'm giving information. And that's what we need as Black people in our culture. We need more information, not misinformation. Masinda, are you there? Masinda, what about Aziza? Aziza and Azizi. Hello, uh, Alan Ross. I'm here. How are you guys doing? Great. Did you, do you have any comments or questions for the author? No, not at this moment. Okay, then. Okay. Well, look, uh, tell us more about the new books you're writing and, and, and other other 
perspective you have on uh, that you're thinking about writing? Okay. Well, I really can't divulge a lot of information because it'll get out there in the ethers and people will try to copy it and whatnot. But I'll tell you what has already been copyrighted and uh, that I can uh, speak about. Opportunity. That's another book I wrote. It uh, is about six individuals from the Compton Carson area who pulled off the greatest cash heist in American history called the Dunbar heist. They stole $18 million from the Dunbar heist and it took them two years to catch them. And they spent 10, 8 million of it and they still can't find 10 million of it. That's what that's book about. Now, the truth out of Compton, that's one of my little pearls to me. I talk about Compton and all the personalities, successful personalities that came from Compton. And because they went to Compton schools and walked on Compton soil and sniffed Compton air, they got where they are. They got what they did and they got where they are today. But really it's all about is all about the uh, the Tracy Carter and Chuck Knight incident. That's what it's all about. Now, uh, in the book, I explain. I try to explain that Chuck Knight really didn't want to kill Terry Carter. Terry Carter was one of his best friends. But you have to read the book in order to really get the gist out of everything. See, they're trying to uh, put Shug Knight up as a criminal. Yeah, he may have done some criminal things with death row records, but I believe that he didn't really want to kill Terry Carter. You're talking about the person he ran over? Yeah, Terry Carter, the person he ran over. Yeah, Sam Berger. Yeah, but Clebone Sloan had a lot to do with that, too. Yeah, they say he had a gun, was pointing a gun at him. Yeah. So those are the books that I've read, and I'm working on another book, and it's all about ancient commission history. I'm already 4,000 words into that one. When you say commission history, what do you mean? Chemites, the people who built the okay. pyramids. Okay. Chemists or chemites? Chemites or the Bible? Big part? Um, right. Was chemites out the Bible or described in the Bible? No, I'm talking about the, uh, the civilization who was responsible for writing the book coming forth by day and by night. Okay. Meta Netter. Okay. Who built the pyramids. It was the Chemites. They, they called them Egyptians. Okay. Mm. Well, well, we know that somebody else changed the name. It was the Greeks. Changed the name from Kemet to Egypt. Mm. Yeah, Dr. Ben talks about that. Yeah. And, uh, my my mentor was Asher Quazy. That's who got me into this. But I Ashwa. always huh? Yeah, I know Ashwa. Yeah, I always knew that it was something going on, Amon Ra. But each preacher that I went to and asked them, you know the best answer that came back to me? You're in spiritual warfare. Mm. that's the best answer but Dr. Ray Hagens he led me along the right path mm. you know Dr. Ray Hagens out of Cincinnati, Ohio you ever heard him? I uh, yeah. yeah I, I listen to him quite often 
Yeah, that Matter brother. Fact, right he's there. about the only he's about the only minister that I will listen to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, he's, put, he's putting that through. Yeah. So he really crystallized my aspirations and wanting to go further in the whole study of metaphysics. And metaphysics is something that we don't get into. We'll get into physics, uh, theoretical physics, elemental physics. We'll get into uh, mathematics, but in history, but the history has been distorted anyway. We know now that Christopher, Christopher Columbus did not discover America. We know this, but they still have it on the internet and it's still a holiday. So what we need to do is get into our own spirituality and melanin and the chakras will allow us to do that by knowing and studying. And we should even study the pyramids, but we don't know how they were built. But I tell you what, if we got into metaphysics, the chakras and melanin, we could find out. Because I believe that you can't cite you can't document spirituality. They don't know enough about it yet. We don't know, but our ancestors knew. See, because they built the pyramids all mathematically and spiritually. And I'm going to divulge what I, how I think they built them in this book that I'm writing now. Well, yeah, they say they call it the mystery. They took it to the grave with them. They didn't, they didn't need no, no uh, material to tell you how they did it, you know. Well, it's, it's something to consider when you say that one of those, one block that was on there, well, at least on the big three, you know, because there's, 90 some odd pyramids throughout the Nile Valley. And Calvin, I guess, was referenced the big three, uh, the last ones to be built. Uh, but one of those blocks, I heard Dr. Ben mention that one, like one block was like a city block long and wide and big. So we know no cranes did that. So that's something to divulge into as to how. Mm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of theories about it, but listen, we're going to get ready to come to a, a, a conclusion, but anybody have any burning questions uh, for, for, the, for the guests? Uh, uh, Ras, Rasha Key, you want to tell them when he's going to be on and uh, at your show and uh, what else? Well, you What's coming up? Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, so tomorrow we have we have uh, Emiliana, a rapper, gymnast, and comedian, twelve year old. So that's tomorrow on the CEN show. And then uh, Brother Calvin is coming up, maybe in about a month. I would have to look, actually look it up, but he's he's coming on soon. And we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit more deeper into some details of. Uh, what type of messages he was trying to convey and some of the information throughout the book. So that, that should be, you know, an extension of this program. So I'm looking forward to it and, and I'm constantly reading. So that's, uh, that's what's going on. That's what's on the agenda for us. I would okay. like to thank you guys for allowing me to be on the program in the first place as a guest. Yeah, yeah, well. First of all, brother, we want you to come back and always feel welcome, that you have a wealth of knowledge and experiences that we need to share. 
if I'm not mistaken, uh, Russia, Russia Key, is it that this is also going to be on a YouTube? Yes, it will. Okay, so you can refer people to the YouTube to get this discussion. Again, we want to thank you. Uh, the grains of sand are few compared to the many thanks we owe you for being a part of this show. And we really appreciate the deep knowledge that you have shared with us and even shared uh, the whole metaphysics and spirituality aspect. But above all, the book. And we urge everyone to get out, to get the book. And at the same time, if you're a teacher and you want to try to deal with gang prevention or gang uh, transformation, youth, youth transformation out of gang, we really urge you to get the book, uh, The Legend of Chris Bell by Calvin Moore. And uh, there'll be more information uh, that we'll be sharing with you. As I said, this is the uh, Conscious Corner. Uh, we, call, we, we focus on black truths. Uh, we try to deal with all the mis miseducation, misinformation, and myths that the European puts out there, the molders of truth, the distorters of truth, and we try to be more clear. And we try to come up with solutions. As Calvin has put this book together, not just for reading, but as a solution to many issues and inspiration to young people that they can do things other than uh, those that are participating in negative things, that there is a way out. If, and he put this in a blueprint in his book. And we hope that many people will use it. Again, Brother Calvin, we want to thank you from the bottom of our heart for your excellent presentation. And on, if you ever have some burning you want to say and get on the show, you give us a call and we'll let you do that. You're always welcome, brother. And hopefully you will listen in to some of the speakers and some of the discussions we're going to be having in the future. Thank you, Alan Ra. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. You must do kind. All right, Rasha Key. It's on you, Rasha Key. Must okay. Kind of well, this is... Uh, the, the theme of our show is each one teach one. So Professor Amin Ra, what's the theme of, of your show? Uh, conscious Corner, Black Truth. All right, Conscious Corner, Black Truth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brother Henry? Yeah, uh, you know, before we sign off, I was tending to get this in earlier. I, I The last show that you had on mental health I didn't realize it was going on. I must have slept it. But anyway, I just like to tap on that just for one hot moment before we leave the air, since I wasn't able to do it when the show was on for those that are listening, that had listened to that show. Uh, and I just, I don't want to be long with it. But anyway, the mental health aspects that we suffer and really due to not knowing ourselves that tied into my first talk about know thyself when you're trying to fit yourself into another man's system value system and whatnot and you're not of that being creates the mental stress that black people suffer so i was like just like to tell the listening audience to think about that you know you 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 know you're a dog trying to be in a cow's value system it'll never work and that's why we suffer from the many mental aspects that we suffer from, because we're trying to be a part of something that we can never be instead of being ourselves, which my well, talk was know thyself. So I'm going to end it with that. Oh, oh yeah. Joe. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Uh, there's one thing that I want to say. One more thing. And it's just my argument. In other words, it's like a thesis is a statement. Intelligence ends where spirituality begins. I, I've heard that from you numerous occasions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna let Brother Roshani wrap it all up and uh, 
great show. Thanks for coming, brother. Me and you talk all the time. I'm sure we will be continue to do that. So I yeah. hope the listening audience was able to get some out of it. Like Brother Ross said, get the book. I've been calling around the country, sharing it with people that I know, uh, educators, trying to get them to read the book to try to implement it into their uh, curriculum. All right, that's it. Okay. All right, everyone. So All let's right. let's end it, and uh, we're gonna do it again. One more thing, Professor Amara. Yeah. When is the when is the next show for you for you guys? Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Okay. And I'll so give you the information. All right. Okay, okay everybody. Brother, 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 you need to talk about that because if this if this Bible study gonna be going on every Tuesday, that's blocking me from being in here like I need to be. I need to talk to you about that. Let me talk to this. Well, well, let's. Uh, I talked to Ross, Ross, uh, uh, Ross about maybe doing it Thursday.